I feel at home completely because uh, all of us, no matter which organization, where you are coming from, we are in the same business, whatever we do. Uh, and we understand each other's uh, issues very well. And the issue that uh, I was asked to comment on uh, is a common issue in many countries. And uh, I'll give, in the context of Bangladesh, what happened to us uh, in terms of relationship with the government and the government's relationship with the civil society and so on. If you recall, Bangladesh was created in uh, 1971 uh, as an independent country. We were part of Pakistan. This was the East Pakistan. And we got into a terrible uh, situation politically. And a lot of people died in a military operation against East Pakistan by the Pakistani military. Uh, and that led to the separation of East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh. And it was a devastating country when it was born. And Henry Kissinger called it a basket case. Uh, no chance for its survival. It's, it has nothing uh, but huge number of people with absolutely no resource to back them up. So that's where our starting point was. And then I returned to Bangladesh. I was teaching uh, in one of the universities here, Marquisboro. I met someone from Marquisboro here. Uh, <laughs> good to check what's happening in Marquisboro. Uh, Middle Tennessee State University, that's where I was teaching. And I went back because Bangladesh became independent. I thought there was much more use for me there rather than here. So I went back and started teaching in one of the universities there. And the rest of it about microcredit and all that happened. If you can compare the situation of Bangladesh in 1971 and the situation of Bangladesh today, I would say it's a, it's a kind of a miracle. It's a, you cannot believe what has happened. Even if you come to the last 20 or 25 years, forget about the long from 71, just the last 25 years. Many of you are familiar with Bangladesh. You worked in Bangladesh. I've met several people who spend a lot of time working in Bangladesh. So you're familiar with that. The way I explain it, I said, if you compare Bangladesh 25 years back or today, what are the striking things that you'll notice? Anybody will say women empowerment is number one. Women 25 years back in Bangladesh, women today is radically different, absolutely different in terms of their status, in terms of the way of interacting with people, and so on and so forth. And many things happened because, uh, uh, to make it happen in 25 years like that. One of them is microcredit. The penetration of microcredit in Bangladesh is absolutely nationwide. Uh, if you define any way uh, the poverty level, I would say more than 80% of the people uh, below the poverty line has very good connection with microcredit, trying to improve their life coming out of those uh, situations. Uh, this is number one. Number two, excess of telecommunication. And this happened in the last 12 years or so. In 1997, we launched a company called Grameen Phone uh, to bring telecommunication in the villages. Uh, before that, having phone in the villages was an unthought of, an unheard of thing. It's a, how can you have a phone in the village? But this was a particular intention of the company to bring telephone in the villages. And then making the women, poor women, uh, to have telephone in their hand and sell the telephone service and make money by doing that. And we call them telephone ladies. We had only half a million telephone in the whole country in 1997, not too far away from today. Today there are 65 million telephone subscribers in the country out of a population of 150 million. So that has created a complete sensation in the whole country. Now communication on the mobile phone and the internet service and so on and so forth is such an easy thing for everybody. It's not just rich people or anybody. Any, anybody you see, ev for every three person in Bangladesh, there's a telephone. Today you may say, oh, it's in the, uh, we see it in Uganda, we see it in this, in Kenya, we see it in other. But this is where it all began in Bangladesh. 
and then it is spread over the whole world in China, India. And India was far behind us when we started this uh, thing. So this is another one that uh, we have in the, in the process. Today, the result is poverty is declining very fast, uh, almost at the rate of 2% per year. We, Bangladesh is one country which will be achieving Millennium Development Goal number one, reducing poverty by half by 2015. We are very much on top of it. And if you continue with that rate, we'll, we'll achieve the Millennium Development Goal number one ahead of 2015. And all the other Millennium Development Goals, of the eight Millennium Development Goals, six of them, we are on track. We have no problem. We are slightly behind on two, including the one with maternal mortality. And we are st st struggling to achieve that very quickly. Healthcare, when Bangladesh was created, with the healthcare indicators, Bangladesh was the bottom most country in the whole region of the uh, South Asia. India, Pakistan, Nepal, and all that. And gradually, very step by step, Bangladesh came by passing every one of them. Today, we are at the top in the healthcare indicators. Our healthcare service in Bangladesh through the government is not the most desired healthcare service you can think. But something happened in the country, healthcare services took up by the NGOs, civil society organizations, make that difference and today in the healthcare, we are on the top. Population growth rate declined very sharply. It used to be 3.3% growth rate of population. Today, it is 1.4. In a Muslim country, to achieve that is a miracle. But Bangladesh is there. So you go step by step, you see the achievements that Bangladesh has made in terms of uh, entrepreneurship in terms of garment industry. Bangladesh didn't have any industry. It's an agricultural land, nothing else. No base, no entrepreneurial class, nothing. And today, booming industry. Young kids came out of the college, became entrepreneurs, started garment industry. Now, so the second largest garment exporter in the world. So, it's, it's all these things happen. How did it happen? And that's a question. Civil society took the initiative. The reason, there's a big vacuum. We had a non-functional government. When Bangladesh was created, there was no practically any government. The people who were elected for the National Assembly in Karachi, they were asked to create a national government. They didn't know that they have to form a national government. They didn't have, we didn't have any secretariat. So while government was trying to discover itself, young people in Bangladesh went ahead to solve little problem they see and so on. That's how NGO tradition began in Bangladesh. When people ask, what is the difference between Bangladesh and the rest of the countries in the, uh, in the subcontinent, in uh, India, Pakistan, and so on. I said, luckily that liberation war opened up everything for the young people. They, saw that, that there is no limit for them anymore. They are not in a traditional bind anymore. They saw a problem, they jumped at it, they started creating this. And all the, all the big NGOs, the famous NGOs that you'll see in Bangladesh, track their origin to liberation war. This is where they begin. So, and we had a free space. Nobody came to ask us, why are you doing that? Everybody said, hey, this is good, you do that. And donors came, they put the money, and the young people came. It became not a local NGO. Bangladesh has a funny thing. NGOs became national right away. They're not, no longer a local little NGO anymore. And that's what happened. And they serve everything, from the little thing to the biggest thing. Anything you say problem, okay, we'll do it. They do it. And they figured it out how to do that and those kind of things. In that environment, microcredit also expanded nationwide big thing. As long as that space was available, that was no problem. But gradually politicians became strong. They started looking at it, hey, this doesn't look good. Government did everything. So there's a conflict now. Now, the time that they want to control, they want to put restrictions, they want to say everything should be done by the government, who are the NGOs to do that? So that's a challenging time that we are passing through right now. Uh, they forget that allowing individuals to bring out their creativity to solve their problem 
is the key to the solution of all the problems. Government may be a very smart government, very efficient government, very honest government, still it has limitations. Limitations that it is a slow machine. You cannot make government machines fa go fast. By uh, out of necessity, not that they are bad people. They are same people as anybody else with good intentions. But the rules and regulations and procedures and all them get them stuck. So if you leave everything in their hands, you are done, finish. Because the world is moving very fast. Every second it becomes faster. And every second governments become get back, they fall back. It's only the citizenry who can make things move faster. And that's where governments make the mistake by controlling things, adopting things, remove, putting barriers after barriers and so on. That's where they put the whole society, whole community, whole nation to get a stuck in a frozen into a world which doesn't have the progress that you desire. Uh, when uh, <coughs> I was uh, introduced to Sam Daly Harris, who was uh, introducing me today, uh, I was uh, suddenly pushed into a little room, which he says his office at that time, to talk to the editorial writers, to change the situation uh, in the legislation, to influence the legislators, activate the individual person to influence the, uh, the legislators. In the US, it's possible. You can influence your legislators to vote in a certain way or another because they uh, really care for what the message is coming from their constituency. Unlike in Bangladesh, they really don't care because if you don't have to, you just wait for the nomination from your party. If you got the nomination, you got elected or something like that, but not here. So it worked. See, he built up the whole group called Results and so on. Again, activating individual citizens to participate in the national decision-making process. If that is not there, there is no democracy. So this is something Sam has been doing with the results many times. I wish he, every, all of us can do that. Every single organization can do that. Activate citizens to participate in the national decision-making process. And many such things can happen in, if we can allow space for the civil society to activate ourselves. One of the issues that I have been raising again and again in my work, and then based on that work, I said, all of us, if we believe that every single person of us has the capacity not only to change our neighborhood, not only to change our district or state or whatever, we have the power to change the whole world, each one of us. It's not a privileged person that you, he has it, she has it, I don't have it. It's not like that. Each one of us has that. Simply, we never allowed that creativity, that ability, that power to come out. If we had done that, if any societal arrangement has allowed that thing to come out, all these problems will disappear like anything. We are always busy with ourselves. And in the process, we ignore the other part of us, each one of us, which can change the rest of the world. So how to unleash that? how to open that up. And when we did the microcredit, that was the whole issue. People see how much loan you gave, what is the repayment rate, what, uh, are their in, uh, income is increasing, they do that. I said, these are tiny issues. Real issues, you have unleashed the capacity of the person. That person who felt that I could not take care of myself suddenly found out I can take care of myself. I am in the driver's seat of my own life. Nobody can control me anymore. And that feeling releases everything. So he or she starts standing erect and say that I can take care. And that is the beginning of the unleashing of the resources, uh, the capacity of the person. And then I looked at all the institutional arrangements that we have made are restrictive. Doesn't allow that capacity to come. Our education system is restrictive. Our government system is restrictive. Our uh, business or the economic sector is restrictive. In our education, we are always telling our young people, study hard, work hard, so that you have a good degree, so that you have a good job. It doesn't excite me. It doesn't excite any young person. 
get a good job, as if that is the end of the world. And that's what exactly the message in the entire education system we give. We never say that you have so much power, unleash it. Be yourself. Forget about all these jobs and things. Things will happen if you, if you can bring it out. Not only you, you do it for yourself, you do it for the whole world. You are not excluded from that world. We don't give that message. So that is where we start. We do that. And then we come to the business world where we say, make money, make money. Profit is the mission. That's business. I said, what about the other business? Business of changing the world. That is not included in our economic theory. So I have been creating these companies, many companies, I've done more than 50 companies. None of them I own any share of. I never created a company which I had one little share in that company. And people say, why do you do that? I said, what? You are not owning the company, why are you creating it? I said, I didn't create it to own it. I created it to solve the problem. That was my intention. And every one of them, when I created the Grameen Phone, I don't own a single share of that company. But this is the most profitable company in the country. But I had no idea that I should own a single share of that company. My whole focus was to bring the service to the poor people, to the women, so that they can change their life. Then I started thinking all these companies, like he created a company called Grameen Energy to bring renewable energy in the country. And it started very small step. People were, what is renewable energy? Why should I have to spend money for that? But we had hard time selling five solar home system per month. People couldn't believe that you can have electricity by this. Today, after about 15 years now, we sell more than a thousand solar home system per day. And it keeps growing every day. More than 600,000 solar home system working. Why did I create it? Do I make a lot of money? I don't even a single share. Nobody makes money out of it. So I started calling them, this is a problem solving company. Then I saw this is not only for Bangladesh, it's for the whole world. And started talking about the problem solving company, calling it social business. I said the conventional business is a business to make myself happy to, by making money. Social business is to do business to make other people happy and, and me, me being happy by making other people happy. People say, ah, oh, this is not possible. People want to make money for themselves. I said, no, that's what we have been trained. That's why we think that way. If you open it up, suddenly it opens up the whole door. So we started promoting this idea of a social business. And we have created so many of them today we have partnership with the big companies like Danone, like uh, BSF. Danone, we have created yogurt to address the problem of malnutrition among the children in Bangladesh, make it very cheap, very delicious. Every child loves it. If they eat this yogurt, only two cups of this yogurt, tiny little cups, two cups a week, child starts growing up, malnutrition starts declining. Within eight months, entire malnutrition disappears just by eating this. It costs very little. So idea of this business is to address the malnutrition in a business way. Why do we get into the control of the government? Because of money, because of clearances to get the money. So once we cut down all those relationship of getting to them clearances, give us the money so that we can do the job, will ever remain in control of that some way or other. I said, can we find a space where we don't have to go back to them for money? If we can design it as a business, as a social business, I don't have to go out. Same money will recycle again and again. I don't have to spend time, 50% of the time, 70% of the time raising funds. So I have, as NGOs, all of us, we have some fringe programs which can be easily transformed into a social business. It came very close, but needs one more step. If we can start doing that, to that extent, we are self-reliant. We don't have to worry about anybody. They can stop money, you can do anything, but it's a business, business goes on. Government cannot say business is bad, because they say, then you have to say all business is bad. We are doing the business, that's all. 
So that's the whole thing. And now that idea started spreading and people say, where's the money coming from? I said, of course this money will be coming from all directions that we have done. Money comes from because we want to make us happy by making other people happy. That's where the money will be coming from. Money will come from philanthropy, money will come from the regular businesses. When Danone wanted to do that, they, they couldn't use their business money because lawyers said, you cannot touch this money because the shareholders gave the money to make money. You cannot invest it in a company which says they will not give you any dividend because it's a non-dividend company. Com uh, social business is a non-dividend company. You cannot use that. So they did the smart thing. They wrote a letter to all the shareholders when they giving the dividend, saying that if you want to spare part of this dividend, invest part of this dividend into a social business that we are undertaking in Bangladesh, which will never give you any dividend, but that will solve the problem of malnutrition in Bangladesh. 98% of the shareholders signed up. All they wanted to raise was half a million euro. That's what's needed for this company. They ended up with 35 million euro. And then after they raised the 35 million euro, which is way above the, what they expected, their employees all around the world started a big campaign against the management. You asked the shareholders to participate in that. You didn't ask us. You think we are inferior than your shareholders? They, we cannot participate? Under pressure, management had to circulate another letter to the employees. It came down to about 70 million euro. They're asking for half a million euro. So now that they have a surplus money, they created a social business fund. So that in future, whatever social business comes, this is the fund which will go into it. So blaming people that they don't want to support social business, blaming people saying all they want is money, it's, not, it's wrong. Simply we never pose the question in the right way. If we did that, it opens it up. Today we have a strange situation. I'll shorten my presentation and quickly ask you. Today we have a very strange situation. People are creating social business funds. Funds are waiting in the social business fund. Enough ideas are not coming about the social business. So money is ahead of the ideas, which is a good sign. Because people say, you can have lots of ideas, but where is the money? Bank will not give you the money because they say, where is the return? Investors will not give you the money, where is the return? But the real situation is different. So what I'm saying that as, we, as a community of us, if you can think of a social business idea and try it out, all you have to do is a very small one, half a million euro type thing, or even 100,000 euro type thing. If it works for 10 people, if it works for 50 people, you know it can be done for 50 million people. That's the idea of a microcredit. It started in a tiny little village. And that's a global phenomenon. All you do is to repeat, nothing else. There's no trick to it. It's a very simple idea, very easy thing. All we have to do, focus our attention only on one thing, solving the problem. Human creativity is so enormous, so limitless. If you put that creativity into action, none of the problems that we see in the world can survive. It's as simple as that. It's a question of bringing it into the right kind of format so that we can address that. And social business, the essence of social business is just creativity, nothing else, not money or anything else. So this is what we should be focusing on. All these problems can be addressed, government problem, other things, which is a kind of disturbance for a while, but they cannot continue because people need it. They can make a nuisance for a while, but cannot go on forever. Thank you very much.